is awesome. I think it is missing a little cowbell, um, but that was quite a way to start our morning. Well, welcome to Horizon. Uh, my name is Ryan. You all look great. It is good to be together. And uh, we are continuing our series called Live and Learn, where we, we have been looking at these time-tested principles of leadership. And I just want to thank Chad. So you guys remember Chad Hoven, right, our senior pastor. Um, so Chad, thanks for slotting me to speak this week where I get to follow up the guy from last week, who I don't know, is just like a very handsome Navy SEAL, right? Like, that's a tough gig. Put up the picture of him, please, Sam. Let everybody take him in in his glory. Um, like, was Joe Burrow not available last week, Chad? Because he's about the only person cooler than an American hero that I could have to follow. Um, so thanks for that, but I'm going to do my best. And uh, if you've been wondering all along, I am not a Navy SEAL. Okay, um, though my favorite color is navy blue, so we're kind of, sort of similar, you know. Uh, but we're going to have a blast today. We are going to start by going back in time. Okay, I want to take you back to your youth. So you remember, for some of us, it's been a few years. For some of us, it's been when black and white TV was a thing. Uh, but go back to when you were 12 or 13 years old. Your hair was thick. Your waistline was thin. And your dreams were as big as the Grand Canyon, Right? You had what I call Hall of Fame dreams, where little Kenny, he wanted to grow up and be Kenny Van Halen, right? Like, <laughs> I wanted to grow up and I wanted to pitch in the World Series. Some of you maybe wanted to grow up and sing and dance on the Broadway stage. But we figure out all too quickly that it's a rough path to get to the Hall of Fame. But today we're going to take a look at an actual Hall of Famer, a man by the name of Kurt Warner, who's an NFL Hall of Famer. But what Kurt found is that the road to the Hall of Fame isn't all that it's cracked up to be. the best. You could be the King Kong banging on your chest. You could beat the world. You could beat the war. You could talk God go knocking on his door. You can throw your hands up. You can beat the clock. You can move a mountain. You can break rocks. You can be a master. Don't wait for luck. Dedicate yourself and you can find a cell. Stand in the Hall of Fame. the distance you could run the mile you could walk straight through hell with a smile you could be a hero you could be the goal you could burn records and anything you could be told do your people do it for your pride you're never gonna know if you never even try do it for your country do it for your name cause it's gonna be a day when you're standing in the hall of fame Politicians be preachers, be believers, be leaders, be astronauts, be champions, be truth seekers, be students, be teachers, be politicians, be preachers, be believers, be leaders, be astronauts, be champions, stand in the Hall of Fame. You can be the champion, you can be the war, 
can be the child, you 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 Team in the NFL, no one's interested. Can I get one of your applications? I promised that I would take care of you and the kids. So that is exactly what I'm going to do. If this is your dream, don't give up on it. Football. Yeah, they didn't pick me. I pick you. I pick you too. Warner. You got the whole package, kid. The world just needs more time to see it. He came up with this whole arena concept. Arena football. It's like a circus. People love the circus. I like the circus. You pay me for a touchdown? I also pay you to win. Oh, this is gonna be fun. Hey, Kurt, we've been trying to reach you. I'm sorry, who are you? I'm with the Rams. This guy's old. Slow as molasses. He's beneath the standards of this franchise. That's what people said about me when I came here. All those years gave you something that others didn't have. Made you ready for this moment. Kurt Warner out of the Arena League. It's one of those stories that's too good for the movies. The perfect guy here. He was bagging groceries five years ago. You go out there. And you show the world what I've known all along. You were born for this. This is my time. I know who I am, and I know why I'm here. All right. Well, hey, that's a great movie. If you haven't seen it, it is on Hulu. Sure, you can also rent it on the old Amazon if you like. Well, hey, in this series, we've been looking at two types of people. We've been looking at deja vu people who tend to make the same mistakes over and over again. And we've been looking at live and learn people, people that make mistakes, but they tend to learn and grow through them. Well, Kurt Warner was a live and learn person. I mean, he is a rags to riches tale that we love Right, he's the biggest underdog to ever put on an NFL jersey. The guy goes from total obscurity, four years, the middle of Iowa, working at a Piggly Wiggly, to making it into the NFL. And in his first year, he wins the Super Bowl and NFL MVP. I mean, stories like this you just can't make up. Okay, and in America, we love two things, okay? Two things we love a whole lot, all right? And forgive me vegetarians, but the first thing we love is bacon, okay? We love bacon. And admit it, if we were passing around trays of bacon right now, church would go to the next level. It would be amazing. Okay, so we love bacon, but we love underdogs. We love underdogs. We just do. In a few weeks, the NCAA tournament's going to start in basketball. And there's going to be one team, there always is, that becomes America's darling, right? It'll be the Cinderella team. And they're like a 12 seed and you've never heard of them. You know, it's like ITT, Georgia Technical Coastal University. You know, go, go fighting mosquitoes, right? Like we're all behind them. Because we love underdogs. And friends, I think it's because it's written into our DNA. Because the God of the universe, he's a God of the underdog. When you look at the Bible, you see story after story of underdogs, men and women whose resumes fall far short of what God's asking them to do. But time and time again, what God does is he works through them to accomplish the miraculous. All right, think of Mary, the mother of Jesus. Hello. Okay, she's like 13 or 14 years old. She doesn't even have a resume. And God's like, hey, you're going to be the uh, mother of uh, 
oh, the savior of humanity, right? Like that's a pretty big gig for her to try to live out. Um, she's an amazing underdog. But the Bible doesn't just give us stories of underdogs. It gives us instructions on how to be an underdog. Because I don't care who you are, whether you're the founder of your company or the finder of a job at Starbucks, okay, or anywhere in between, like don't we all just want to grab life and wring out every last drop of meaning and purpose? Don't we all want that? We want to be underdogs, well, the Bible gives us instructions on that. And today we're going to see instructions from the world's smallest underdog, okay? The tiny little ant, all right? Anybody deathly afraid of ants or even allergic? Okay, well, that's going to be awkward because we released like 50,000 of them a few moments ago because um, we wanted to make this a little performance piece, okay? Um, so if you feel something on, totally kidding. The only ants in here are the ones that naturally live here. Uh, but the ant is an amazing animal. At any given time, there are 20 quadrillion ants on earth. I don't know how many of that zeros that is, but it's a bunch. Okay, for every one of us on earth, there's 2.5 million ants. If you were to add up the mass of all of the ants on earth, it adds up to the mass of all of the humans. So we better hope they don't, like, get a union and, you know, start working together or we could be in trouble. Um, and maybe you've heard this. There's a type of ant that can lift 50 times its body weight over its head. All right, so if you weigh a buck 80, do a little math up or down, that's 9,000 pounds. An ant would be like you lifting three Honda Civics above your head. Like, it's just crazy. Okay, so the ant's an amazing underdog. But what we're going to see is that in the ways that the ant is an amazing underdog, Kurt Warner was an amazing underdog, and we can be one too. And the main idea of today is this, that if you want to live out an underdog story, on the playing field of your life, then you need to live like the ant when you find yourself on the sidelines. So let's check out this ant wisdom, underdog wisdom that God gives us here. It says, go to the ant, you sluggard. Not my favorite nickname, right? That sounds like your great grandpa is giving you a burn. You sluggard, right? You sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise, which having no captain, overseer, or ruler, provides her supplies in the summer and gathers her food in the harvest. So the Bible is saying, hey, look at the ant, and look at the ways that the ant is wise. And, and today what we're going to see is there's three ways that the ant is wise that help it to be an underdog um, that we can live out in our lives. Okay, and the first one is this, is that underdogs listen to their internal coach. That very, there um, in verse 7 it says this, it says that... Um, they have no captain, no overseer or ruler, and yet they do the right stuff. So the ant doesn't have a boss standing over it saying, do this, do that, do that. And, but maybe you're thinking, you're like, Ryan, I've watched Animal Planet too. What about the queen, Ryan? There's a queen ant. I know that. Um, well, the queen, if you study it, is basically just like a glorified egg vending machine, okay? All she's doing is popping out eggs, <laughs> all right? She's not calling the shots. She's just popping out eggs. So somehow the ant does what's right. And we're enlightened humans, so we know that's called instincts. Yes, it's called instincts, that the ant has this internal coach that tells it, hey, you're going to be a foraging ant, or you're going to be a hunting ant, or you're going to help guard the colony, and it lives that out. Well, in a minute, we're going to watch a video where Kurt Warner is interviewed, and he's going to be talking about his life, and he's going to say something very similar. He's going to be talking about where there's ups and downs and, and doubt in his life. He said there was always something internally that said, you've got this. You can do this. There was always this internal coach. And, and I don't think he's just talking about that internal cheerleader that like our mom plants inside of each of us, right? She's like, honey, you're so cute and you're so great. And, you know, the internal cheerleader that we all have. Um, I don't know if you remember Saturday Night Live. Do you remember the, the 90s where there was Al Franken? And he had a character called Stuart Smalley. You guys remember Stuart? Stuart was like a life coach. Okay? And he would sit on a stool with better posture than me. And he would look in the mirror and he would say, I'm good enough and I'm smart enough and doggone it, people like me. Right? Like, I think we realize pretty quickly in life that like our internal cheerleader, it's, it's not going to get us very far. And, and honestly, it's kind of inaccurate. And sometimes it downright lies, right? Like, here's what my internal cheerleader will tell me, okay? It'll say, hey, Ryan, you can totally pull off those skinny jeans. And I'm like, 
really? Can I totally pull these off? And I'm like, you know, I'm putting on the skinny jeans. It's date night. Me and Becky are going out, you know, and we're walking and I'll catch a reflection in a window and it'll be like a jump scare. Like, oh my gosh, like I, I look like a fat flamingo, <laughs> right? Like it's the internal voice isn't the most dependable. But Kurt Warner's not talking about that because he's a man of faith. He's talking about the voice of God. It says this in Isaiah. It says, your ears shall hear a word behind you saying, this is the way. Walk in it whenever you turn to the right hand or whenever you turn to the left. And here's what I would say. It's like, hey, wouldn't you want that to be true? Right, like no matter where you are on the pendulum of faith, whether you're over here and you're team Jesus all the time, you're like, I've got Jesus tattoos and I've got Jesus bumper stickers and my kids' middle names are hope, faith, and love, baby. Right, like you're here or you're in the middle and you're kind of exploring. You're like, well, I love Jesus and I love Buddha and I love Odin and I love whoever uh, John, yeah, I can't think, whoever Tom Cruise is worshiping, like I love him too. And, or, or maybe... You're over here and you're like, you know what? Like, I don't believe in Jesus at all, but you stupid Christians keep giving out free coffee and bagels. You know, so I'm showing up. Like, it doesn't matter where you are. Like, would, wouldn't you want that to be true? Right? Like, wouldn't you want it to be true that when you find yourselves on the sidelines of your life, the sideline of your career, your marriage, your health, like wouldn't you, wouldn't you want it to be true that the God of the universe is speaking to you, whispering over your shoulder, hey, go this way. Well, well, I believe he is, okay? Like I believe that the God of the universe is speaking to us and not just, hey, I'm God, everybody, like collectively, but like to you. He's saying, hey, Larry, hey, Larry, I got something, listen. Or hey, Ryan. But it's hard to hear him, Okay. Have you guys ever been watching an NFL game, right? We watched a lot of Bengals this, this fall. And uh, the Bengals are on offense, and they're doing the huddle. Okay, so all the guys are, like, huddling up, smacking each other in the butt. Let's go, yeah, yeah. You know, and, and Joe Burrow, he's, like, standing out there, like, you know, the Greek god that he is. And he, he looks over at the sidelines, and he's got his hands over his helmet holes, right? And I'm like, does he got, like, a migraine? Is he telekinesis? What is Joe doing? Um, but what he's doing is inside of that helmet, there's a headset where he can hear the voice of the offensive coordinator, okay? And up until 15 seconds before the ball is hiked, um, Joe Burrow can hear that voice because it gets loud at stadiums, right? Did anybody go to a Bengals game this year? Anybody Bengals game? Go to any of the big rivalry games? or the, Anybody go to the playoff game? Yeah, I did not. So if you're looking for a uh, Bengals buddy next year, I would love to be your plus one. Just throwing that out there. Um, but when I watched it online, it looks so loud. It's amazing. There's like a light show and pyrotechnics and video stuff on the screen. I think maybe lasers. And I mean, there's smoke and everybody's chanting who day. And it's, it's just awesome. Like I totally had FOMO, like a fear of missing out. Like I missed it. It was amazing. But I think it's a great analogy for life and trying to hear God's voice. That like God doesn't scream. And we live in a very, very loud world, right? And it's not all bad stuff. It's friends, family, kids, career, life, jobs, all of, all of that. But it's loud. I asked Todd, who's our excellent sound engineer back there. Todd, in a second, is going to pipe in about eight seconds of stadium noise, okay? And, and while he's doing that, I want you to try to continue to listen to my voice, all right? So, Todd, I'll go on your mark. So... So God's saying, hey, I want, I want you to come this way. And then I want you to try to come this way. And I want you to know that I'm going to be with you in the middle of it. Perfect. Okay, what did I say? Yeah, all right, you couldn't hear it. It's impossible. Well, that's life. God's like behind us, tapping us on the shoulder, and it, it's so loud. We're like, I can't hear you. Well, well, here's the thing. Can you get quiet enough? to ever hear the voice of God? Well, I think you can. I want to challenge you with something, okay? I want to challenge you with this, all right? And it's a huge ask, okay? Massive ask, all right? Five minutes of your time. 
Okay, sometime in the next two weeks, I'm sorry, two weeks, I want you to take five minutes of your time and I want you to get away from whatever screams for your attention the most. So if you're a parent, that's children, right? Um, so don't abandon them, just figure out five minutes away from them. Um, maybe it's, if you don't have kids at home anymore, maybe it's your iPhone, a little Facebook, a little Netflix, maybe it's your work laptop, whatever that thing is that's screaming for your attention, I want you to find a time in the next 14 days to take five minutes, okay? And I want you to find a good comfy spot where you feel safe and happy. So maybe, maybe for you it's a, a chair in your house or on your porch patio. Maybe it's in a local park. And here's what I want you to do. Okay, I want you to sit there and I want you to say four words. I want you to say, God, I am here. And then I just want you to breathe. Breathe in and breathe out. I don't want you to start confessing all of your sins. Like, dear God, forgive me for stealing that bubble gum when I was six. Right? Like, I don't want you to do that. I don't want you to start asking God for stuff. I've, I've really had my eye on that Tesla, God. If you could uh, just sit there. Just sit there and see if God speaks to you. Five minutes. That's it doesn't matter if you're here, here, here on that pendulum of faith. Like, it's worth your five minutes, right, to see if the God of the universe might be whispering your name. And I can't promise you what's going to happen. I, don't, I can't promise you he's going to speak out loud, right? Yeah, I've never heard God speak out loud. I feel like he speaks to me. He leads me, but I don't, feel, I don't hear his voice. I can't promise you if some cute little squirrel is going to come out and, like, break dance, and you're going to be like, there is a God. This is amazing. Thank you, right? I don't know. But what I would say is it's certainly worth your five minutes, okay, to, to see if the voice of God might be calling your name. And, and the voice of God was calling Kurt Warner's name, and I want you to listen to it in his own words. There were a number of moments in my life when uh, I felt like, for whatever reason, people didn't believe in what I was capable of doing. The biggest low point was going from Green Bay Packer training camp. So I'm, I'm right there. I'm inches away from being able to accomplish what I've always dreamed of accomplishing. Uh, get cut by Green Bay, and a couple weeks later, find myself working in a grocery store at night, um, trying to figure out how do I chase my dream? Because there's no, there's no roadmap. Uh, there's no path that's set out for those that are working in a grocery store to find themselves in the NFL. And as hard as those moments were, um, and as frustrating as they could be at times. I think the fortunate thing for me is, A, I had a great support system, but I never lost faith in, in who I was. There was always something internally that just said, you got this, you can do this. Even after, like when I was with the Rams and won two MVPs and went to two Super Bowls in three years, and then two years later I'm cut by the team and you just sit like, how in the world can this be happening? But I was very fortunate that, you know, that I never really lost faith in who I was. So I grew up in the church, went to a Catholic school all growing up. My mom was making sure that we went to, to church every Sunday. I understood the stories. I understood, uh, you know, Jesus and, and how all of that worked. But it was never really personal for me until after I, I met my wife. When we were going out or, or when we were spending time together, it was either us making out or us talking about Jesus. It was one of those two things. I wanted more of the making out. She wanted to talk more about Jesus. She challenged me uh, early and often in our relationship about what I believed and why I believed it. I think before that, I always felt faith was kind of, well, God was out there and whenever I needed him, he was like my, my spare tire that when I get a flat, uh, I'll go and pop the trunk and, and pull out the spare and God, you know, I, I need this. But you dive into the Bible and you actually start reading the Bible for the first time in that kind of context. And you start to realize, oh shoot, I had this mixed up. That, uh, that God's not just here for me. That the goal is that I'm here for him. I'm here to give my life for him as, as Jesus did for me. And it started to become real. I started to understand and take a different perspective on what life was all about. And it took some, some, some crazy moments to, to really understand that. And, uh, you know, one of those moments was when her parents were, you know, tragically killed in a tornado. I remember how, you know, she didn't have all the answers. She was, uh, she was angry uh, and she was willing to, to call out to God and, and ask God why and, and yell and scream. Uh, 
but never lose her faith. It was never one of those things where, oh, God, you allowed this to happen to us, so now I'm gonna walk away from you. That's what a relationship is to me. It's about being able to, uh, you know, to disagree in moments, to be angry in moments, but not allow that to stop the relationship. And to me, that was when I kind of stepped back and go, everything that she's been talking to me about, this is what it looks like. This is what it's supposed to be. And it was in those moments where I came to realize, okay, I've never had that. And that's exactly what I want. Um, and it was at that time where I really committed my life uh, to Jesus. And we look back now and we go, we're so grateful that God's plan was better than our plan. And even though we didn't see it for a long time, he's always there for me no matter what the circumstances are, no matter if it's the highs, the lows, the goods and the bads, that he's with me through all of it. And I love where he says, hey, hey it began to become real to me, right? That that first piece of wisdom of being the underdog here is, is uh, listening to the voice of your internal coach. Um, but the second piece goes beyond that. It's, it's trusting the voice of your internal coach when it doesn't make sense. And, and we see that here in, the, in these verses where it's talking about the, the humble ant. And it says um, it, she provides her supplies in the summer and gathers her food in the harvest. In a lot of translations, this word provide is store up. So the essence here is that the ant is smart because it stores up food when it's abundant so that it can eat when it's scarce, right? So just imagine you're the ant, okay? You got six legs and you're prancing around Cincinnati. It's the middle of July. It's awesome. Flowers are in bloom. Fruits are on the trees and vines. There's strawberries, there's tomatoes, there are cucumbers, right? Stupid humans are doing picnics and festivals and dropping food everywhere. And you're an ant and you're like walking around. You're like, this is amazing. This is like ant heaven, right? There's food everywhere. And there's this voice though in your head that's going, store up food. And you're like, why would I store up food? I'm living in a watermelon. My, my home is my food. This is great. Store up food. You know, and the ant has to decide in that moment, like, am I going to listen to the voice of my internal coach? But am I going to trust it when my circumstances um, don't really back it up in the moment? So think of old Kurt. Okay, so old Kurt graduates from mediocre college with a decent career, but doesn't get drafted. Four years in total obscurity, working at Piggly Wiggly, right? Not really Piggly Wiggly, but like Piggly Wigglies. He's stacking those cans of cream corn, those Wheaties boxes, right? And all along, there's this voice saying, hey, Kurt, hey, Kurt, keep, keep stacking the cans. Keep doing that. You got to provide for your family. But at night or when you're not working, keep working out. Okay, keep running, keep hitting the gym, you know, keep throwing that old pigskin around, Kurt. Keep making those calls to those NFL teams on the old rotary phone. Keep sending those VHS tapes in. Just keep doing it. And in the moment, like, how much sense does it make? Right, like, it kind of gets a little pathetic and embarrassing probably at some point. Where you're like, year one, year two, year three. Everybody's looking like, poor Kurt. <laughs> When's he going to move on? Uh, but he, he keeps trusting even though his circumstances don't really back it up, he keeps trusting the voice of his internal coach. And thank goodness he does, because when his opportunity comes, right, he gets invited to play in this new thing called arena football, which at the time was just in like glorified barns, okay. And he's so prepared that when he jumps in, he's the best player in the league right away, okay. And he stands out so much that eventually he gets a call from an NFL team, the Rams, and through some injuries and other things, he's so prepared that he becomes the starting quarterback and wins a Super Bowl, right? Like, that's amazing that, that friends, when opportunity comes in front of us, there's no time machine to go back and get better prepared, right? You kind of are what you are when the opportunity pops up. And Kurt was. That in life, sometimes there are tests that you know are coming, right? Like if you went to med school, you took a, an MCAT, right? Like an entrance exam. Or if you're a lawyer, you took the bar exam. If you're a financial planner, you did a series seven. There's tests to be educators. We know there's some tests that are just going to come up and we can prepare for them. We can study. But if I'm being honest, and man, I really want to be honest, especially from up here, right? Like most of life isn't about the planned tests. It's about the pop quizzes, right? 
Like, like that's most of life as pop quizzes, that you have no idea that this thing is coming for you a year out, a month out, a week out, a minute out, a second out, and then bam, it smacks you in the back of the head and lands on your desk in front of you, right? The pop quizzes of life. Right? And it sounds funny, but it's terrifying. Like, because when that pop quiz lands on your desk of your life and you read those blood results and you say, oh, no, that's, that's not good. There's no time to go back and then prepare for that moment again. Right? You, you can't do it. Or when that pop quiz smacks you in the back of the head and bam, lands on the desk of your life and it's from your employer and they say, hey, thanks for the 20, 25, 30 years, um, but we're going in a different direction. Here, here's a sweet plaque, costs $12. You know, and you're like, thanks. I hate you, right? Like, it's hard. And there's no time in that moment to go back and prepare yourself to be the person to handle that pop quiz. Um, well, what if what I'm arguing is true, though? What if all along we have access to an internal coach who wants to stand behind us, tap us on the shoulder, and give us wisdom for the journey? What if all along that internal coach wants to ask us to trust him in ways that may not make sense with our circumstances? Um, wouldn't that be amazing? Because when the opportunity arises, we, we are who we are. You, you can't go back. And friends, here's the best part of Christianity, I think. Okay, there's a lot of cool things, free bagels, coffee, all that. But um, the best part is you get the wisdom of God. Okay, so you get the God of the universe tapping you on the shoulder, being like, hey. And you get the Bible, which is a book of wisdom, story of God, life, and man. But you also get his presence. You get him with you for the pop quiz. Right, you get, you get the wisdom, but then when the pop quiz hits and you're sitting there and you're taking it, you're like, man, this is hard. God's sitting there with you. I, I have a friend, um, and she's, man, in the last couple of years, she had a, just a hard pop quiz of life. That after a couple decade long marriage, she got the, the pop quiz that landed on her desk of, of betrayal by her spouse. And... and Gosh, talk about mind-numbingly painful and excruciatingly crushing. And after decade, couple decade long marriage, it ends in divorce and it's messy. There's kids, there's stuff, assets, there's all of that. It, it's, it is just a messy, painful situation. And, and I would watch from a distance and see her, her share and the, the pain. It was just written all over Right? It's like it was in, in her, her voice, it was on her face, it was in her eyes, the anger. And maybe you've been there. But what, I, what I've heard her say in, in different ways and in different words is like, hey, even though I never would have wished that in a million years, that, that there was this, this beauty of having the wisdom of God, because she had been walking with God for a while, um, but she really, what I've heard her relay is the presence of God. I feel like, hey, in the middle of this most painful, horrible moment of my life, which was horrible and painful, God met me in a new and fresh way. That, that even in our worst nightmares, God's presence can be the silver lining. And I would say today she is living out an underdog story of just rising from the ashes of that in an amazing, amazing way. And, and Kurt Warner shares about facing similar challenges in his life. And he says this. He says, I look back and realize God's plan is always better than our plan. We didn't see it for a long time. He's always there for me no matter the circumstances, the highs, the lows the good and the bad, and he's with me for all of it. Friends, how amazing is it that, that we can have an internal coach whose voice we can listen to, whose voice we can trust, uh, but then he sits with us through the pop quizzes, right? Like that, that's the kind of God I want to serve. But, but as we look at this wisdom, it's listening, it's trusting, and the last piece of wisdom from the ant um, is that underdogs know they need a wake-up call. Okay, underdogs know they need a wake-up call. If we continue here in uh, this part of Proverbs, it says, How long will you slumber, O sluggard? 
Here's my favorite nickname again. When will you rise from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. So shall poverty come on you like a prowler and your need like an armed man. So you read these verses and it's obviously talking about laziness, right? Like you're like, oh yeah, sluggard, lazy, sleep, slumber, got it. Um, And in the agricultural society this is written to, certainly to be lazy was to be dead. (laughs) Because if you don't plant your seeds and you don't tend to your crops and you don't harvest them, then you don't eat. And uh, last I checked, you can only go about 40 days or so before you die. Uh, So it's very important not be lazy. Um, But I think there's more here for us than just the physical laziness. Though apply that to your like Netflix, social media habits, all you want to. Um, I think for most of us sitting here watching um, me online, for most of us, we're pretty busy, right? Like most of you are pretty accomplished, you're pretty successful, lots of professionals. Most of you aren't sitting around like twiddling your thumbs, you know, looking at your belly button, right? Like you're not doing that. Like if your family's anything like my family, like Becky and I, we both work, okay? And we work, we come home, we try to throw dinner on the table and sometimes it's healthy, sometimes it's sort of healthy and sometimes it's Chick-fil-A right? We, we get dinner on there and we have four kids from 17 down to seven um, and they all do different things every night. Isn't that pleasant? Um, so we're taking them to basketball practice, voice lessons, swim lessons, cheerleading, good things, young life, church, right? We're going all over the place. I mean, it's literally like six ping pong balls just get thrown in a blender and it's, you know, we're picking lottery numbers every night. By the way, our lives are just bouncing all over. Um, But here's the question for you and for me, is can we be very busy but still asleep to the most important parts of life? Or or another way to put it, can you have full schedules but empty hearts? Man, I, I feel that sometimes. So there's this creature right now on earth. It's called a zombie ant. Has anybody ever heard of a zombie ant? Okay, I'm not talking about your Aunt Ethel during the apocalypse. Um, I'm talking about the little ants we've been talking about all day. Okay, so ants, there's a, a type of ant that gets a fungus that infects its brain. Okay, and the fungus has a big scientific sounding name called Ophiocordyceps unilateralis. Okay, and old Ophio, it infects your brain and it takes it over. Okay, and these ants, as that fungus grows in their brain, they begin to lose motor control of their bodies. Where they're moving, they look like ants, but the lights aren't on upstairs anymore. Okay, they're not moving under their own will. This fungus has literally made them into zombies, which is terrifying. Um, it, It describes it this way. It says, the ant starts to become hyperactive and no longer has the same daily rhythms of the other ants. Most carpenter ants, for example, forage during the nighttime, but the infected ant basically becomes active all the time. <laughs> and, and I think this is such a great analogy for what I'm tempted to do, and maybe what you're tempted to do is that we get infected by this fungus of busyness and we become really busy ants. And we look around and we're like, I'm busier than that ant. Those silly carpenter ants, they actually sleep. (laughs) I'll sleep when I'm dead, right? And you get so busy, but upstairs the lights aren't quite on with what really matters, right? You're not busy in the right ways. That that underdogs know that sometimes they need a wake-up call. And Kurt Warner had a wake-up call just like this. Okay, he shared in that story that, that tragically, and I can't even imagine this, his wife's parents die in a tornado. Like talk about pain, talk about questioning God. And, and he watched it as his wife who had a faith that he did not at the time struggled with this. And she was mad at God and angry at God and she screamed at God and she had doubts and questions. But at the same time there was this peace that existed and a faith and a strength and a a hope, and, and she didn't give up. And he watched that happen, and he said these, these words. He said, in those moments, that's where I realized I've never had that. That's exactly what I wanted. 
And, and friends, what I would ask you, that I ask myself, is have you ever had that moment that, that Kurt has right there? Where you're thinking about the God of the universe and the way you're seeing that relationship between him and, and his wife or that relationship between him and another person or you're just learning about God here at Horizon and you think, man, I never had that. Like I, I, I never knew God loved me immensely even though he knows everything I do. I never knew that God forgives me. I never knew that God had such peace to offer me, such strength to offer me in the midst of the pop quizzes of life that stink. And, and I, I want that. Well, maybe today's your, your wake-up call. Maybe God's tapping you on the shoulder, saying, hey, I'm real. Woo! I, I don't know. Um, but what I do know is that the God of the universe who made the simple ant and made a simple man like Kurt Warner and made simple simpler man like me and very smart people like you all, okay, that that God, he has an underdog story to write in each of our lives. And maybe it's a, your career, maybe it's your family, maybe it's your uh, community, maybe it's the world. I don't know if you know this, but there's people at Horizon that run global nonprofits. They have like day jobs and families and then they're saving people from sexual slavery in India in their free time, right? They're just underdogs. It's amazing. Um, and I would encourage you to think about, could you be an underdog here at Horizon? Like my day job is I lead the family ministry here. I have an amazing team of all-stars that work with our infants through our high school students. But I also have a few underdogs on my team. Okay, I want to tell you about one, a guy named Tom Bolt, okay? So Tom Bolt is a buddy of mine. I have permission to share and say everything I'm about to say, so keep that in mind. <laughs> uh, Tom Bolt is an underdog when it comes to high school ministry, okay? He hangs out with high school kids every week. He comes to the 830 here, and then he heads up to the garage to hang out with high school students. And Tom Bolt is 62 years old, okay? I know he looks like 42. He looks, he's, he's as fit as a fiddle. Um, but he's an underdog, and he goes up there, and, and Tom is not cool, okay? <laughs> Just keep that in mind. Like, Tom is not cool. He doesn't go in there wearing, like, cool clothes and trying to talk cool with the kids, like, hey, that's lit, right? Like, he doesn't do any of that. Like, like Tom just, like, doles out the dad jokes, you know? Like, I've never seen Tom's phone, but I assume it's like a jitterbug, you know? <laughs> it's like they were advertising it during the Wheel of Fortune, and he ordered it. Um, but he's awesome, the kids love him. Like he shares about life and faith and he owns a business and he's married and he has adult kids. He does stuff. He's busy like all of us and he, he brings them into that. And then for a select few of them, over the last six years I've watched him, there's been several guys that needed a dad in their lives. That there was a vacuum there. They didn't have an adult man leading and guiding and loving them. And Tom has stepped into that is an underdog and he shows up in their life at like their games and their awards nights and he's amazing okay because the truth of the matter is most of us aren't going to be underdogs that win Super Bowls we're just not right and most of us aren't going to be underdogs that play in Van Halen though now it's getting easier um, <laughs> most of us aren't going to be underdogs that sing and dance on the Broadway stage but here's the thing friends we can all be a Tom Every single one of you can be a Tom and show up where you're needed the most and give what you have to give and, and live out an underdog story that God has for your life. And I want to finish with just three questions today. And maybe one of these is for you. Hey, what is the internal coach inside of you? What is he whispering over your shoulder right now? What's he tapping you on the shoulder and saying? And, and can you get quiet enough to hear it? And the second question is this, is where is your internal coach asking you to trust him right now when it doesn't make sense? And then the final question is this, is how might your internal coach be asking you to rise up, to wake up from your slumber, to not be the zombie ant, to wake up, rise up, and live out the underdog story he wants to write in your life? You're broken down and tired You're been life on a merry-go-round You can't find the fighter But I see in you So we go work it out And move mountains 
we gonna walk it out and move mountains and I'll rise up rise like the day I'll rise up rise unafraid I'll rise up and do it a thousand times again Here, here's the, the best news for last, that, that as we try to rise up in our small ways in spite of the ache, that, that God rises up to meet us, man, that he longs to meet you in the middle of whatever pop quiz you are facing in your life right now. I want to end by telling you about one opportunity. Um, next Saturday, we have an amazing event coming up with our buddy Ken Kington. Okay, it's called The Four Critical Decisions. Um, there's been a lot of research on four critical decisions that leaders have to make um, to be awesome at what they do. And this is open to men and women. Um, next Saturday morning, you can register on our website. So you, I hope you have a great week. If you ever want to talk, there's always somebody by the hearth room, um, which is out there on the left. So have a great day.